The following program is the work of the broadcast students at the British Columbia Institute of Technology. BCIT Magazine features news stories from around the Lower Mainland which were produced over the last week. Responsibility for the content of the show rests completely with the students and their instructors. Coming up on BCIT Magazine, a diver makes a surprising discovery. Buzz around a BC Olympic bid. And commercial pilots are preparing for takeoff. Welcome to BCIT Magazine. I'm Leila Khadir. And I'm Aidan Sarah. Here's what's happening in Metro Vancouver this week. The world is hoping a new ceasefire agreement between Israel and Hamas will stop the violence that has rocked the region for close to two weeks. In Vancouver, a wide range of people took to the streets to voice their outrage about the loss of life. Reporter Mohammed Hussein has our top story. Demonstrators took to downtown Vancouver last week to raise awareness about the recent atrocities that have taken place in Palestine. Two hours ago, I got news that my 13-year-old cousin was shot in the eye in Hebron. So the first demonstration took place on Wednesday in front of the Vancouver Art Gallery, and then an even bigger one took place across multiple areas on Saturday. All Palestinians now! must be organized. Demand every industry to stop funding genocide and apartheid. The recent outrage stems from Israeli police forcing residents in an East Jerusalem neighborhood out of their homes. Israeli officials say that the current residents of the land have no legal title on the properties. A spokesperson for the UN High Commissioner of Human Rights says what's transpiring is violating Israel's obligations under international law as that part of East Jerusalem remains under Palestinian occupation. <laughs> People of Middle Eastern descent weren't the only ones that came out to demonstrate. You guys, none of you guys are Palestinian from originally? No, no, we're not. No. I don't think it matters where you're from. I think the injustice of what's happening is pretty clear. Join us in demanding that the government of Canada take action to force the state of Israel to respect human rights and international law. We stand in solidarity with our Palestinian brothers and sisters against ethnic cleansing ethnic cleansing and against the oppression of Palestinians and for peace, justice and freedom for all in Palestine and Israel. The recent situation has left 192 Palestinians and 10 Israelis dead. For BCIT Magazine, I'm Mohammed Hussein. Reporter Mohammed Hussein joins us live. What's the latest on the conflict? Well, Aiden, the ceasefire was reached on Friday morning. The UN Secretary General said that he welcomes it and that Gaza is an integral part of the future Palestinian state. However, the ceasefire is already being tested as Israeli police are, cl police are clashing, clashing with Palestinians at the Al-Aqsa Mosque following the Friday prayer. So what's next for the people that organized these demonstrations? Yeah, the Canadian Palestinian Association recently announced that a vigil will be taking place this Saturday in front of the Vancouver Art Gallery. Back to you. Thanks, Mohammed. A free diver recently helped DFO officials bust a string of illegal crab traps in waters around Vancouver. As reporter David Nadalini found out theft like this could have a big impact on marine ecosystems. To dive in our waters, you do have to be diehard. For as long as he can remember, Chris Sampson has always wanted to be in the water. I've always been a swimmer. I've always held my breath and gone below the surface, but I wanted to take it one step further. Sampson is a freediver, which means he can dive and legally spearfish without using an air tank. On May 3rd, during a dive near Jericho Beach, Sampson noticed an unusual line hidden behind some kelp. I decided to pull on that line and see where it led me. I had a hunch it was going to be two illegal crab traps, and when I pulled on that line and I saw that first trap, I knew exactly what I was looking at. Samson reported his findings to Fisheries and Oceans Canada, which located more than 250 illegal crab traps in the English Bay. 
DFO Detachment Commander, Arthur Dembski, says an investigation into illegal crab fishing in BC is underway. This impact is not just crab, but it's anything that can go on a trap. We've had investigations uh, that led us to processing plants and we've investigated these plants. So, so we're, we're trying to stay on top of it as best we can. Dembski says the flawed design of these traps also threaten aquatic ecosystems. Samson says illegal fishing doesn't just affect crab populations, but also his family. When these illegal people go out there, they're literally stealing from my family. They're, they're taking food off my plate. Um, I found one legal-sized Dungeness crab since September, and I'm in the ocean a couple times a week. So they're definitely having an impact. Officials say poachers can face upwards of $100,000 in fines for trapping female or undersized crabs. As for Samson, he is content knowing he's helped protect Vancouver waters. Having that out of the water, those traps, it was a really re rewarding feeling. David Natalini in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. Vancouver City Council is considering the pros and cons of hosting the 2030 Olympics. The man behind the 2010 Olympics says that this time it would be province-wide. JC Chambers gives us the details. Will the Olympic torches be lit again in 2030? The man behind the 2010 Vancouver Winter Olympics says it could happen province-wide. Instead of having two or three host communities, which we had last time, which were Vancouver, Whistler and Richmond, we're talking about as many as eight or nine. People who now live in the former Athletes Olympic Village are excited for the possibilities. And I think it would be just a really good vibe to have it in the city again. Furlong says that the pandemic has added a different narrative and reason to hosting the Games again. So now we see this as an opportunity to help rebound the economy out of COVID, to provide a beacon of hope, uh, inspiration, to lift the province out of the dark place that it's in today. One Vancouver City Councillor says that hosting the Olympics doesn't solve already existing issues like affordable housing. They contribute to um, more people wanting to come here and rising real estate values. So that's one of the causes of our housing prices going up. As a result of the 2010 Olympics, people say we already have the infrastructure in place to host again in 2030. So it's not going to cost us anywhere near as much as last time? Councillor Swanson believes that the restrictions COVID-19 has brought makes the event more intriguing to BC residents. See, when we're in the middle of a pandemic, and we're not having any socialization. I think what's appealing to some people is just the idea of having a big party. Uh, 2010 was, I don't know, one of the best events in Vancouver's history. Furlong says the city has to think long and hard before agreeing to host once again. It, it really requires pretty well everything you have to give to make it happen. I mean, the, they give you seven years to organize it because it takes seven years. Vancouver City Council will continue to study the pros and cons before moving forward. I'm JC Chambers in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. The COVID-19 pandemic has forced airlines to greatly reduce capacity on planes. While that's been tough on passengers, it's also grounded flight crews. Reporter Joshua Rice hits the tarmac for this story. COVID-19 has created a $17 billion loss for Canadian Airlines last year. Between mandatory social distancing while loading the plane and being seated to decimated business travel, the result has been routes cut and air crew either laid off or made part-time. Brent Pryor is one of the 3,000 pilots in his airline currently flying reduced hours for reduced pay. Right now, I think we're up to about 8 to maybe 10 percent of our normal capacity based on this same time frame years previous, not 2020, but 2019 and previous. Prior hopes that vaccine rollouts and possible COVID-19 passports may put the wind back under the wings for the industry. I would dare say that we're all for that. And, and I mean, we're for any measures that are that's going to get this airline, and indeed all airlines, back up and, and flying. If current trends continue, the industry may take off soon. So far this month, there have been 40 suspected cases of COVID-19 on BC flights. Well, at this time last month, there were 130. I'm Joshua Rice in Nanaimo with BCIT Magazine. Coming up after the break, rallying against an alarming trend. And nature lovers, take to the trees. The 
everyone. You're listening to BCIT's The Crow. Thanks for joining us. Have a good night. And these are your stories for 11 a.m. I'm Hugh Perkich, and you're listening to BCIT's The Crow. Tuning in to the Andy Shire Show here on AM 1680 The Crow. BC officials just released a new COVID-19 update. The Canucks playoff hopes continue to dwindle as they lost to the Toronto Maple Leafs 4-1 yesterday. And you're listening to BCIT's The Crow. Welcome back to BCIT Magazine. Anti-Asian racism has increased since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. One Burnaby woman is taking a stand and has convinced others to take one too. Reporter Kevin Yee tells us how. Thanks to Doris Ma, May 10th is the official day of action against anti-Asian racism in cities across Canada. She started a social media hashtag and it's now a nationwide event. Like I said, it all started three years ago at my kitchen table. I totally thought this is just going to be a Burnaby thing. Ma was called to action after she learned about the rise in racism against Asians. I heard that there was an Asian woman being harassed by a white man in a Safeway, which is only five blocks away from my house, where I shop almost everything. And I thought this woman could have been me, could have been my daughters, could have been my mother. This is when I realize that we have to do something. Ma says that awareness needs to be raised and that it is important to speak out in support. Many in the community showed up to do just that. And in general, I'm just uh, very passionate about social justice. Uh, Asian hate doesn't stop. <laughs> People are already working on making this an annual event and are trying to get more cities to participate. Um, but I'm sure that we'll be working on um, some more tangible ways for people to help uh, end systemic racism. Statistics show that anti-Asian racism has gotten worse during the COVID-19 pandemic. Since last year, Burnaby has seen an increase in reported anti-Asian hate crimes of 350%. In the same time frame, Vancouver has seen an increase of over 700%. Many of them have been in Chinatown, including the defacing of the lions at the Millennium Gate. Ma vows not to let the racists win. But I think this is only just the beginning, just the beginning of forming coalition and allies. Kevin Yee in Vancouver for BCIT magazine. Many campers are struggling to get outdoors with reservation filling up and COVID travel restrictions still in place. But one eager camper is finding ways to make the most out of it. Reporter Sadie Chang gets outside. Bonnie Sharp is packing the family camp gear. Problem is, she doesn't know where or when they'll be able to drop their trailer at a campsite. With many other would-be campers clambering to get outdoors, the provincial booking site is jammed. What we found is sometimes at 7 a.m. when the bookings would start, uh, you would have the system would crash, then you would try to re-sign on, and by then the campsites may be full. The COVID-19 pandemic continues to curtail long-distance vacation plans, creating a busy local camping season. British Columbians must reserve their campsites two months prior, and current health orders restrict travel outside their health authority through the Maylong weekend. We had an overabundance of new campers, and we really, truly don't have very many provincial campgrounds. But there is a glimmer of hope, thanks to cancellation of out-of-town reservations. Around 20% of camping reservations made through BC Parks have been cancelled through to May Long Weekend. This accounts for around 5,000 bookings. Customer comes into the trailer. One RV yeah. rental business is still booming thanks to the demand for local camping reservations. And clients are booking well into the future, anticipating the removal of travel restrictions. People that had bookings to go to, let's say, Manning Park or the Okanagan, they've had to reschedule and a lot of them are regulars and they book again for next year. 
so it hasn't had a huge effect. This is a store for us for camping. As her vacation time approaches, Bonnie Sharp knows she may have to opt for something other than a provincial campground. We'll make the most out of it, out of it by going locally. Uh, probably by then, we'll have to resort to private campgrounds. While BC campers are resilient, they remain anxious to expand their camping horizons beyond health authorities if and when the health orders change. Sadie Chung in Maple Ridge for BCIT Magazine. Reporter Sadie Chung joins us now live. Sadie, what happens to camping reservation that people made outside of their local health authority? Operators are canceling reservations uh, that were booked at provincial campgrounds outside their health authority uh, between April 19th to May 25th. And BC Park says campers will ensure that they receive a full refund. And with the May long weekend coming up, what penalties could people face for non-essential travel outside their health region? Travelers could be subject to a $575 fine and an additional $230 ticket if they refuse to comply or engage in abusive behavior. Back to you. Thanks, Sadie. Several outdoor activity centers have struggled since the beginning of the pandemic, but now with more people craving fresh air adventures, businesses have had an opportunity to rise to the occasion. Reporter Emma Albert explains. Oh. Tall activities like this one aren't for the faint of heart, but for some, the recent need to be out of the house may push them to new heights. We've seen a lot of people come out. They say that they're looking for safe activities to participate in during the pandemic. Outdoor climbing activity centers in the Lower Mainland, like Wild Play, had experienced some struggles in the beginning of the pandemic. It was hard. You're having to manage expectations of people and guests, as well as keeping ourselves and our staff safe and our guests safe. Attractions like this one were included in the shutdown at the beginning of the pandemic. The Grouse Mountain Zipline, Zip Trek Tours, and attractions with the Adventure Group in Whistler were all forced to reevaluate procedures. So far, the industry has adapted to the changes, adding social distancing, mandatory masks, reduced capacity, and COVID-19 waiver screenings. Since the restrictions have made the public continuously bored of their own homes, people are anxious to get outside. I think when we first reopened, it was a little bit slow to start. People were hesitant, uh, but when we reopened for a season, uh, for this season in 2021, we have seen a lot more people coming to the park and looking to get outside. Places like Wild Play have become somewhat of an outdoor escape for people during quarantine. And it's an outside in the, I don't know, healthy environment. So just challenging yourself. It just sounded like um, something fun to do. Quarantine has brought a larger need for an industry of outdoor activities. With the weather getting warmer once again, the public may be finding more ways they can spend their time outside. Emma Albert in Maple Ridge for BCIT Magazine. There have always been diehard fans of vinyl records, but during the pandemic, collecting vinyl has become increasingly popular. My co-anchor Aidan Sarah finds a new generation who are discovering an old groove. Cameron Coolidge is prowling the vinyl record stacks, looking for his next big find. Cameron is a newbie collector. He says he was always interested in vinyl record collecting, but it was the pandemic that finally pushed him into his passion. Found it was a, I've always been I've always been very passionate about music uh, collecting and uh, listening, and it was always I was always going to get into record collecting. It was just a matter of time. Even if you didn't grow up listening to music on vinyl, record collecting is an allure to people of all ages. I mean, this morning I had this uh, this. This, uh, this kid comes in with her dad all the time. I think she, she can't be more than 13. She plays the drums, which is awesome. It's the best instrument ever, that and the keyboard. Um, and she just rifles through the store, just looking for anything. And with younger generations showing newfound interest in vinyl records, bands aren't just releasing new records to streaming services. They're being released and discovered on vinyl too. I got the brand new Greta Van Fleet album. I uh, 
newer, younger band that I've been into, and I actually haven't listened to this yet, even though I've seen it on Spotify. I wanted to listen to it first on uh, vinyl. There is definitely a call for a lot of the newer stuff. Um, we carry tons of it. We try to anyway. There are plenty of things about COVID-19 that society would like to leave behind. However, Dustin is sure the renewed love for records will be something that continues on. I don't think it's going away. I think, I think, I think these things are going to be around for quite some time. Aiden Sarah in New Westminster for BCIT Magazine. Coming up, a new way to stop fires and litter. And teddies with teeth. Going live in three, two, one. BCIT television and video production. You've got potential. That's a wrap, folks. BCIT, your future starts here. As forest fire season approaches, there's a new innovation to reduce human-caused fires. Reporter Tiger Ann has more on what the city of Vancouver is doing to keep butts under control. Doesn't matter if you're on the streets or in a forest. Cigarette buds can be seen everywhere. And with the forecast of a hot summer ahead of us, that is a concern for BC Wildfire Service. We have an average of 1,500 wildfires in, in BC every summer, and 40% of those are um, generally human caused. Uh, certainly, um, discarded cigarette butts that are still lit have the ability to spark wildfires. In an effort to prevent fires and reduce cigarette waste, the city of Vancouver introduced these free portable ashtrays in 2019. So they came up with this little pouch. It's padded on the inside so it can't burn. It's fireproof, it's smell proof, it buttons up, and then you just put that in your pocket. So you always have a place, no excuses, not to discard your, your cigarette butts in an appropriate place. At the Pacific Spiri Regional Park, smoking is not allowed. However, cigarette butts can still be found throughout the trails. City of Vancouver says cigarette butts are the most common piece of litter, with over one million butts discarded every day. First of all, I can't stand the fact they even smoke in the forest because that's not that's against the rules. So littering in the forest is awful. It's going to be hot. Could cause fires. I am appalled that people would even smoke in there. Vancouver has set up 11 locations for these ashtrays over the past two years. That hopefully translates into fewer fires, something the province thinks could be one possible solution for other areas. And certainly um, that type of technology and any technology that we could, um, could potentially um, adopt that would limit those fires would be excellent. Tiger Ann in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. Many businesses are barely hanging on during this pandemic, but when a new art gallery is showing, it can survive and even thrive. Our reporter Angelina Ravelli checks it out. Vancouver's Dimensions Art Gallery opened last summer during the pandemic, and the co-founder says its online presence played a big role in attracting new guests. We use social media for our paid ads, as well as uh, we have articles that are written and so Instagram and Facebook posts. The gallery describes itself as a unique interactive experience with all the art created by local artists. But there is more to it. It's just keeping everyone who's coming through really happy um, and then you know seeing where it goes from there. And if you ever find yourself here, be sure to pay close attention because everything may not be as it appears. Daryl says Dimensions Art Gallery will continue to run following COVID-19 health and safety protocols.
such as mask wearing and social distancing. I'm Angelina Ravelli in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. A North Vancouver teenager has an art project that has taken off during COVID, turning teddy bears into monsters. And it's all part of his recovery. My co-anchor Leila Hadir shows us more. Teddy bears may look cute, squishy, or creepy. This is Elliot Froze, a 19-year-old artist who uses horror art as a coping mechanism. So I have lots of different um, mental health issues and addiction problems. So uh, when I do this art, it kind of helps me as like an art therapy kind of thing. It's not only therapy. Fro sells his handmade stuffed animals on Facebook for as much as $90. This guy here, he got on C Fox News' Facebook page, and I got quite a bit of publicity from that. It may seem like an odd form of therapy, but one therapist says any kind of art can be therapeutic. Art can be a really great substitute for more harmful behaviors, um, something that interests and engages the mind. It can um, be very creative and it can also um, give meaning to people's lives, it could give them a purpose to their life. These stuffed animals were the first step for Froze to start thinking about art therapy as an educational path and a future career. I definitely want to pursue art therapy as a career. So I'm going into psychology at CAPU and then I'm going to well, plan to go to a private expressive arts therapist school so that I can help others express themselves through artistic means. Well, this young artist has also turned my cute teddy bear into a creepy one. Leila Khader in North Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. That's BCIT Magazine for this week. I'm Leila Khader. And I'm Aidan Sarah. Thanks for tuning in, and we will see you in September.